Four minutes. Four minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that means I'm supposed to be thinking about that. Three, four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I think it's about time to get going. Today we have with us Dr. Furman, originally from Germany, but now now here with us today. And she's going to be talking to us about extracellular signals regulating eye development. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I gave my last grand rounds four years ago, so I think we have some nice, interesting new data. So. Um, um, I thought this is a good time to jump in and um, on a short notice and talk about it, tell you a little bit about it. My lab is, I'm an associate professor in the department and I'm a researcher. My lab is located on the third floor here on the sou in the South Tower. And you're very welcome to come anytime and talk to me if you have questions or, um, yeah. And so my laboratory is interested in the role of um, signaling molecules during eye development. And um, we are specifically interested in um, how extracellular t signals during early eye development mediate tissue-tissue interaction to ensure proper eye development. And we, are s we have a um, major project in the lab right now wh in which we specifically um, test the role of extracellular factors in development of the pigment epithelium, um, <coughs> which is schemati schematically shown here. So you know very well how important the retinal pigmented epithelium is. I will abbreviate it um, as RPE in the future um, throughout the talk. Um, <coughs> so our goal is to understand the cellular and molecular mechanism that regulate um, different stages of RPE development. Um, and <coughs> since there's not much, since we know quite a bit about the functions of the RP in the adult eye, um, we, so we know quite a bit of um, um, adult function of the RP or function in the adult eye, we don't know so much about um, development um, of the RPE itself. And that's the focus of my lab. So let me tell you a little bit about RPE development in general, what we know so far. So during early eye development, um, um, the first vi visible sign of eye development in the developing embryo is um, the evagination of the um, new epithelium of the ventral diencephalon. This is during early forebrain development, and the eye is one of the first um, um, visible um, evaginations of the brain. So in the human embryos, you can see the eye about um, four weeks of gestation. And the evagination of the ventral diencephalon leads to um, the formation of the so-called optic vesicle. And at this stage, the optic vesicle is bipotential. So you can see that the neuroepithelium is very homogeneous, and it's one layer of cells that are, um, um, have this columnar epithelium that is typical for the neuroepithelium at this stage. And um, the whole domain of the optic vesicle can develop either into the retina or the pigmented epithelium. Subsequently, um, and I've de depicted this in this um, funny pattern here in the green and um, brown kind of stripes. So green um, shows later on um, <coughs> um, where the um, RPE will develop and the sand color will show is showing where the retina is developing. So subsequently what happens um, is that the distal part of the optic vesicle um <coughs> contacts the overlying surface ectoderm, which is shown here in red, and this interaction is very important for subsequent invagination of this part. So this leads to the formation of the so-called optic cup, and the inner layer of the optic cup, or the <coughs> former distal part of the optic vesicle, invaginates, and you can see here 
at this later stage a very nice optic cup forming. And the overlying epidermis, or so-called lens epi um, ectoderm, also invaginates, forms a vesicle, and then subsequently pinches off the surface ectoderm. So <coughs> interestingly, both retina and RPE, so like I said, the RPE is developing here in this green domain, have a common embryonic origin. And interestingly, the RPE develops into a no non-neuronal tissue um, subsequently. <coughs> So what we know at this early stage is that um, there are two, at least two genes that are expressed throughout the optic vesicle that are very important during RPE development. Um, so one of them is o OTX2, which is a transcription factor. It's called orthodentical homeobox uh, gene 2. It was originally identified in Drosophila. And the other one is MITF microsoma associated transcription factor. And these genes have been shown to transactivation pigmentation genes, so they upregulate every the whole pigmentation machinery in the developing um, eye. In humans, mutations in OTX2 can cause ocular malformations that ran, range from bilateral anophthonias to retinal defects, so there's a whole um, diversity of malformations um, detectable. And in mouse, loss of function um, of MITF or OTX2 can result in microsomia or, and or transdifferentiation. And I will come to that back later, what transdifferentiation means. So initially, these two genes are expressed the, throughout the whole optic vesicle. And <coughs> one of the, of the questions that we have is, how is expression of MITF, for example, upregulated in the optic vesicle? Because during early embryonic development, um, you have overlapping gene expression, and there's actually uh, not clear how these genes are, like MITF, specifically upregulated. Up the expression is spe specifically upregulated just in this region. And a good mechanism by, by through this by which this could happen is um, that adjacent tissues um, to the optic vesicle upregulate, um, secrete a signal and upregulate expression of specific genes like MITF here. And the tissue, the tissue that is a really good, um, could be a really good um, producer of the signal is the extraocular mesenchyme. I've po I'm pointing here with the arrow, red arrow to this tissue. This is just a loose, accumulation of cells that migrate out from the dorsal neural tube during embryonic development, and then they migrate into the um, facial areas and also downwards ventrally um, to populate um, the neuroepithelium. And in the brain, for example, this tissue is very important for forming the meninges. And <coughs> in the eye region, um, these cells, the Ocular, extraocular mesenchyme, which is derived from neural crest and from mesoderm, is important for formation of the sclera, the choroid, extraocular muscles, the corneal stroma, for example. So they migrate, um, um, surround the eye, and then later differentiate and migrate further into specific locations. And it's actually not very well understood how this is regulated, too. <coughs> so, um, we think that this extraocular mesenchyme very early during um, eye development plays a role in induction of RPE formation or inducing the RPE fate in the optic vesicle. And um, why I think this is um, sh may shown in this picture, which shows a very early mouse, a section of a mouse embryo through the forebrain region. And here on this side, you can see the evaginating optic vesicle and um, which is shown in bluish tissue here. And <coughs> it's surrounded by the mesenchyme, which is labeled here in green, and it's labeled specifically for um, a marker at this time, AP2-alpha. And you can see that the whole optic vesicle is surrounded by mesenchymal cells. And this is really early during eye development in the mouse, so this is just when it starts. The mouse mice embryos are born after 19 days, so this is half, half of um, the uh, embryonic time. 
and um, we can see expression of retina-specific genes about a half day, three quarters of a day later. So this is, this is way earlier before retina development actually starts. Um, so we looked at expression at this early time point of um, RPE-specific genes, in this case MITF, and what we found is that um, Indeed, MITF is very early expressed, and this has been not reported before. So um, you could just, you can extrapolate a little bit and hypothesize that at this stage, um, the RPE fate may be actually the default fate during eye development, and then that retina promoting signals come later and induce um, retina development. <coughs> so to further test the role of the extraocular mesenchyme, we um, s established an explant culture system in mouse and also in chick. I will come to that in a um, few minutes. So this shows a whole mouse embryo at E9.5, and you can see, so after half of the embryonic time, and you can see here the, the evaginating optic vesicles. This is the forebrain region here. And what we did is we dissected out the optic vesicles and um, cultured them in the presence or absence of these extraocular tissues. We can enzymatically treat these tissues and then remove um, some, some components like um, the overlying surface ectoderm here. And in this case, we, um, which is shown here, and in this case, we also remove the extraocular mesenchyme shown here in green. And when we culture these optic vesicles um, for a couple of days and then look at the expression of um, eye-specific genes, um, in this case MITF again, we can see that in the presence of mesenchyme, this RPE marker is strongly expressed. But when we remove the mesenchyme, in most of the cases, MITF is not expressed. So the extraocular mesenchyme is really important for upregulation or at least expression of this um, RPE-specific gene, and this here shows um, normal in vivo expression of MITF in the uh, mouse embryo. So what we wanted to know also, what we are wanting to know right now is what kind of si signal does the extraocular mesenchyme secrete to upregulate MITF expression? And <coughs> we know a little bit, um, we have an idea from chick experiments where these experiments are a little bit easier, and we've started actually out doing this in chick and then we moved into mouse. <coughs> so what we found here again is MITF expression in the optic vesicle in chick, and um, there's a little difference in chick, which is interesting from the evolutionary standpoint maybe. Um, in chick, MITF is expressed only in the future RPE domain. It's never expressed in the whole optic vesicle. <coughs> so um, when we um, similarly um, conduct explant cultures with mesenchyme, we can see robust MITF expression here in the explants with mesenchyme. But when the mesenchyme is removed, most of the explants don't express MITF. And we can rescue this defect by the addition of certain factors. And in this case, it's, it's a TGF beta family member um, called Activin. And this effect is very specific because other TGF beta family members like BMPs, for certain BMPs that, that were good candidate molecules don't have this effect. So this is a very strong and robust effect. And um, so this shows that the tissue is responsive to addition of this factor, and we have now more um, new data showing that it's actually required. So what we did to test this is um, we took this condition, explants with mesenchyme, and added a um, molecule that inhibits uh, specifically activation of this pathway. And um, this was indeed the case. So we could really, this, this kind of, um, shows more biological endogenous relevance for this pathway in RPE formation. And we also use this molecule to um, code beads, shown here in blue, um, with this um, code beads. 
And these beads, you have to soak these beads in this protein. It takes it up, and then you can implant it into the tissue, into your or close to your tissue of interest. And then slowly, this these um, proteins get released from the bead, and they diffuse into the uh, surrounding tissues and um, exert their effects. And this is very common in embryological experiments, especially in chick, for example. <coughs> so in control um, embryos in which the bead was coated with a control molecule, MITF expression is very robust and um, continuous in the developing chick eye. But when this um, TGF-beta or active in inhibitor was um, introduced, you can see here that this eye shows a local downregulation of MITF expression. So this shows that really in vivo, um, endogenously, the TGF-beta pathway um, um, uh, plays a role in at least promoting MITF expression. And we think that this is really um, the first step <coughs> during eye development in inducing um, RPE formation. So I want to go to the next uh, developmental step. Um, I've told you about our induction. Uh, in developmental biology, you talk about induction of um, a tissue, an organ, or um <coughs> so the next step would be um, how is um, the RPE domain or how is the RPE fate in the developing eye maintained? And I want to come back here with um, to the concept of transdifferentiation that I mentioned before. So even though MITF, this RPE-specific gene, is induced, and other genes um, like OTX2 are also necessary at this early time point, we know, and pigmentation can even start, but under certain conditions, or manipulations or defects, um, the RPE can lose its pigment-specific character. So it can lose pigmentation, downregulate um, pigment-specific genes, and actually adopt a different fate. So it can develop into a second neural retina. Um, <coughs> and so um, this suggests, st strongly suggests that there must be additional mechanism to maintain um, the RPE fate in the optic cup. And <coughs> we are interested in these signals too because this is important for congenital defects and also for stem cell biology. Um, so one really good candidate pathway is the TGF-beta, um, uh, the wind-beta-catenin pathway. So wind are secreted um, glycoproteins that are uh, actually activating at least three different pathways. And one of the best characterized um, pathways is the wind-beta-catenin pathway, or so-called canonical pathway. So, <coughs> the so winds bind to so-called frizzled receptors and LRP co-receptors, and this leads to the sequest to sequestration of a destruction complex, which is shown here. This destru destruction complex contains axon, APC, GSP3, beta. So um, this destruction complex is pulled away from the central key player in this pathway, beta-catenin. So if winds don't bind to the receptor, beta-catenin is continuously produced and degraded by this, um, which is mediated by this destruction complex. And when winds bind to the receptor, um, beta-catenin is sta stabilized in the cytoplasm and can translocate into the nucleus, bind to TCF left transcription factors and activate transcription of downstream target genes. <coughs> so, what is really nice, several groups have um, generated report, so-called reporter mice. So you can use basically <coughs> a DNA sequence um, that um, activates um, these target genes here and um, connect it to a so-called reporter. So you, you can use fluorescence reporters, or in this case, for example, NEC-Z, which encodes for beta galactosidase. And then you can do a uh, nice color staining, and every cell that turns blue has activation of the canonical pathway. And what we found is that early during development, so this is the optic vesicle um, stage here in mouse, a cross section. <coughs> at, 
at the optic vesicle stage, and you can see activation of the reporter in the dorsal optic vesicle, but not at earlier stages, and the RPE domain would be also a little bit more here in this direction. So we start seeing it here, and this is when MITF is already expressed. So it's not important, this pathway is not important for upregulating MITF, but we think it's important for maintenance of MITF and um, OTX2 expression, or maintenance of the RPE fate. Um, at later stages here, um, this is a part of the eye, here's the lens, here's the retina, and there's strong ro reporter expression in the developing RPE. This is a few days before birth. So <coughs> in order to test this, um, the role of the wind beta catenin pathway during RPE development, a former graduate student in my lab, Peter Westenskull, um, con um, specifically disrupted beta catenin in the developing eye, um, starting at this stage. And so this is shown in this picture here. Um, you can see a mouse optic cup at um, little two days later at 11.5. And the red um, color shows uh, expression of a retina-specific gene, <coughs> in this case VSX2. And the green color again shows expression of an MITF, in this case of an RPE marker. And in the mouse mutants that have this um, pathway inactivated, <coughs> you can see that the green color in the dorsal RPE is disappearing, and actually the red color is coming up. So that means that RPE-specific gene expression, and we've shown this for other RPE-specific genes too. RPE-specific gene expression disappears, and retina-specific gene expression is upregulated. And yeah, we've tested several different markers. So this is a typical e example for transdifferentiation. And what it ha it's, is happening also is um, what I forgot to mention before besides um, downregulation of pigment-specific genes, also the mutant RPE starts to proliferate quite a bit. In order, it actually really makes a second retina. It gets as can it get as thick as a second retina. So all this, these later differentiation markers in the retina get robustly upregulated. It's amazing how this tissue can develop into a second retina. <coughs> so um, we were wondering if how MITF, if whether MITF could be directly regulated by this pathway. This has never been shown that these RPE markers like MITF or maybe even OTX2 can directly activate it by a signaling pathway. And so what Peter did is he, he looked on the molecular or DNA level. So, <coughs> so in this case, um, the upper picture shows a gel um, in which um, he um, loaded um, samples that um, were treated in the following way. So he took RPE from a very early stage, grinded it up, and isolated the DNA in a way so that all the associated proteins um, are still bound to the DNA. So you have to be very quick. Um, one researcher who does this very um, often um, says that the proteins actually can fall off uh, if you're not quick enough and, and doing this, this um, um, assay quick enough. So you have to make sure that the pro you want to see what is bound to the DNA. And so, um, um, so you have to um, um, sample the DNA with the, with the associated proteins, and then the DNA is chopped up in little pieces so that it's um, manageable. And <coughs> um, and then you do chromatin. Uh, then you do an immunoprecipitation. So you want to test whether, for example, TCF left, which are the transcription factors that bind to the RPE-specific genes or the promoter of these genes, if they're really bound. So you take an antibody against these transcription factors and pull out those DNA pieces together with the proteins where these transcription factors are bound. So you get a, an enrichment of these specific regions. And then the good thing is that we know usually what the sequence, we can, we can estimate 
um, where these transcription factors are bound, we know the sequence and we can PCR and enrich these DNA regions. And this is shown here. So this was actually precipitated not with TCF left antibodies, but with beta catenin antibodies, which is even better because it shows that beta catenin binds to TCF left and TCF left bind to the MITFD um, promoter in this case here. Um, <coughs> so we get, we have, th we, Peter identified three different regions in the MITFD promoter that have TCF left beta catenin bound to them. So that means in vivo, this is actually the pathway can really activate um, MITF um, um, transcription of this gene, uh, or can at least bind to it. And then you have to do another test to see whether this interaction is actually a, an activating um, action. So you do a luciferase assay where this piece of the MITFD promoter is um, again connected to a reporter and then you transfect cells and um, like HEC293 cells and you co-transfect um, your modulators of interest. So in this case, um, beta catenin for example. And you can see that this reporter is strongly upregulated when beta catenin is um, also introduced at in the cells. And this is not happening when you add, in addition, um, a repressor of this pathway. And this is one very good control. What Peter also did is he mutated in this promoter region the binding sites and then looked what happens in this reporter assay. And you can also see that this doesn't lead to a significant upregulation. <coughs> so these are assays that we use to show a direct molecular interaction between a signaling pathway and downstream factors that are important for ocular development, in this case RPE. So <coughs> this is a little summary for this first part. So I told you about what we think about RPE induction, that this activin-like molecule is produced in the extraocular mesenchyme. We, right now we are testing in mouse whether the intracellular machinery of this pathway is required for RPE development. Um, so we're doing tissue-specific inactivation of these transcription factors um, that mediate um, activation of this pathway, and this is not so easy right now. We think that maybe this early activation of this TGF beta pathway or activin pathway is important maybe for, could be important for upregulating wind ligands in the RPE and those in turn um, um, ensure or uh, make sure that R the RPE fate um, in the developing eye is um, st stabilized by activation of the wind beta catenin pathway. So I've shown that um, hopefully convincingly that beta catenin and TCF left directly transactivate the MITF and we've shown this also for OTX2 genes. So what we also think and what we're testing right now at later stages, we can see that the wind reporter is still active in the RP and at one point it gets downregulated. So we want to test at later stages whether this pathway is required for RPE differentiation to upregulate, for example, all these functional genes um, that are important in the adult eye. So RPE functions like phagocytosis and, and um, epithelial transport, um, for example. <coughs> so one question that we also have, and that leads into the second part, is where do the winds come from? Are the winds expressed that, that ensure maintenance of the RPE? Are they expressed in the me mesenchyme? That is also possible. They can express, like I mentioned before, um, in the RPE or in the retina um, also. So in they can be secreted by the neighboring tissues and then by diffusion they activate this pathway in the RPE. And we started a new project in the lab in which we can affect all the wind production um <coughs> in different tissues specifically. So this shows actually um, um, what is happening to wind ligands in the producing cells. So, so far I've told you what is happening in the effector cell or the um, cells that receive wind signaling. And this is um, um, what is necessary for winds to be secreted. And so winds um, are modified. So they are um, 
um, produced um, in the ER or they are, they are transported to the endoplasmatic reticulum and this purple um, structure here um, shows the different transmembrane um, proteins of this transmembrane domains of this protein which is called porcupine. This is an enzyme that is located in the membrane of the endoplasmatic reticulum and it's an as, as acyl transferase that um, attaches um, um, lipid moieties to the wind um, molecule. <coughs> and this happens in the endoplasmatic reticulum. This lipid modification or palmutilation is really, really important for secretion of winds. People have thought it's also important for activation of the pathway in the um, receiving cell, but thus that doesn't seem to be the case. So it seems to be really important for subsequent secretion. So there's um, more happening in the Golgi apparatus with other components of this pathway. Um, so, and this uh, prerequisite, which is crucial, is, is this lipid modification in the end of winds in the endoplasmatic reticulum. So the other thing is that this enzyme porcupine um, seems to be very specific for um, wind signaling. And, and it's assumed that all winds are um, affected, not only the ones that activate the canonical pathway, but all other pathways too. So this was very interesting for us. It's kind of, it's a more global um, approach, but it could show us, um, first of all, where are winds um, from which tissue are they are important, and second, what other path pathways um, might be important during eye development, uh, the other uh, wind pathways during eye development. So this enzyme is broadly expressed in the early embryo, specifically in the eye, shown here. And it's you can see that this, this is um, also uh, suggests that um, specific disruption is necessary, otherwise you, um, it has been shown that this, <coughs> if you disrupt this gene, it leads to early um, disruption of mouse development. <coughs> so in humans, interestingly, um, mutations of this gene cause um, an X-Lent dominant syndrome, it's called focodermal hypoplasia or Gold's syndrome. And <coughs> Um, since this is X-linked, most of the female patients that have been found are heterozygous, and it's usu they are usually sporadic mutations, but there are also some inherited um, cases, but usually they are um, caused by fathers that um, received, obtained this mutation in a mosaic manner, and then um, they, they, um, they um, yeah, could yeah, give it to their daughters, basically. <coughs> and these, this syndrome is high, highly pleiotropic and has variable congenital abnormalities. <coughs> and mostly they are, um, um, these patients have patchy hypoblastic skin or uh, dermal atrophy, for example. They have digital ocular and dental malformations. And um, specifically what I've mentioned here is they have fused or missing digits, split hand foot, um, cleft lip, uh, lip, and lip and palate, and specifically concerning the eye, um, there's iris and chorioretinal coloboma ob observed and anophthalmia and microphthalmia. So this disease is rare, um, but also may be underestimated because a lot of the patients uh, uh, might might die in utero. <coughs> so for us it was very interesting to um, look at the porcupine, role of porcupine during eye development a little bit more closely. And um, I think for time reasons I will not go through this, but I want to mention <coughs> it that again we did this tissue specific inactivation of porcupine and we started doing a disruption of this gene specifically in the retina domain. And the effect of this experiment is shown here. So what we observed is that um, spe tissue-specific or loss of porcupine can lead to coloboma, pigment abnormalities in the RPE, and eye also eyelid closure defects. So 
the left side here shows control embryos. This is a mouse embryo at E13.5, a close-up of the eye. And um, this shows a mouse embryo at, at E15.5. And um, you can see here it looks a little bit fuzzy, so that means that the eyelid is covering the eye. In porcupine mutants, what can happen is that um, there's less pigment, so um, in comparison to the control eye. And in this case here, we have a coloboma, um, so the optic fissure doesn't close properly. And what we also often observe is that the eyelid doesn't close properly um, during development. And we thought that we have a tissue-specific deletion, but unfortunately, and this is um, um, quite often this case, in, uh, when you use transgenic mouse lines, you have to be careful and do the control experiments. So we thought that we have a retina-specific deletion, but it's actually not the case. So we have um, um, a more global disruption of this gene because the transgenic mouse line has um, expression where there shouldn't be expression, um, basically. So we basically, what is interesting is that we have a, a situation that is more similar to the human patients where they have a global or heter a mosaic heterozygous mutation of the porcupine allele. And we, we came to this because um, we noticed that there were several embryonic defects that were not plausible. For example, these um, digit defects with the syndactyly, or we had tail defects, open body walls, um, um, open skin, um, yeah. And also a cleft um, palate, um, obviously, which could be explained, maybe explained by an early um, porcupine expression that somehow affects um, close by tissues like the um, facial primordia here in this case. So we think that we have a more global um, deletion of this gene and we started looking at these embryos and um <coughs> a little bit more in detail on a molecular level and we found, for example, one obvious um, um, thing that we would look was the activation of the uh, canonical pathway. And this, ex this green labeling here shows expression of another target gene, uh, one of the target genes of the canonical pathway. It's LEF1, which is also a mediator actually of the pathway. And in controls at E13.5, this is the eye here, here's the lens. You can see strong expression in the mesenchyme and also here in the overlying surface ectoderm and a little bit in the peripheral eye. And in the mutants, um, we see that this surface ex expression or epidermal expression of LEF1 is decreased, and there's an upregulation that we can't really explain right now here in the dorsal RPE. At later stages, um, at E15.5, again, here's the peripheral expression in controls. Um, we have some expression here in the cornea, corneal epithelium, for example and then strong expression in the eyelid mesenchyme. And in the mutants, um, you can see that the eyelid is open here, it's not connected. And some of these mutants have um, downregulation of this effector in the corneal mesenchyme. So it would be interesting later to look at the cornea, for example, if the cornea develops properly. Um, in terms of, um, I told you that our other work has shown that the canonical pathway is important for RPE um, differentiation. And so we were interested in how does the retina and RPE in these mutants develop. And what we found that in the mutants, um, some of the mutants show this a dorsal downregulation of, or not only dorsal, but also in, this ca in other cases here in the back of the eye, um, of MITF, for example. Another RPE-specific marker um, shows, more in this case, a more strong downregulation in the um, developing RPE, and this whole tissue here is the mutant RPE, so the whole tissue is starting to develop into the retina. And OTX2 is also expressed in the retina at this stage then, um, earlier not. And then this retina-specific marker, VSX2, shown here in green, starts to become upregulated in the RPE. So in the mutant RPE. Um, so this shows a typical case again of trans differentiation, um, which is consistent with our previous results. But I told you, we think that this is a global deletion, so we still don't know 
which tissue provides the wind for, um, for the pathway activation and the RPE. So this is something that we are doing now. We are looking, um, we are trying to uh, make sure that we have mutants that only have disruption of porcupine in one or the other tissue. And what we actually find is that when we disrupt it in the retina, so these are, I call them true tissue-specific inactivations, when we disrupt it, do a single disru disruption of um, porcupine in the retina only, or in the RPE only, or only in the mesenchyme, we don't see transdifferentiation. So this suggests that at least two tissues in combination provide winds that are important for RPE development. And we are doing now combinatorial um, tissue-specific deletions, which are a little bit more difficult um, to get. <coughs> So the other um, um, little um, project that kind of came up with this is the coloboma, which I think is very interesting. It's, it's quite common in comparison to other congenital diseases, um, a microthalmia, for example. I mean, between 3 and 11% of blind children worldwide, it depend on depending on where you look. I think in third world countries, it's, it's quite high. And <coughs> Um, several genes have been identified that ca can cause coloboma, but these um, are the minority of cases. So um, a lot of cases are also caused by environmental um, effects, so alcohol, for example, or even vitamin A deficiency. So, um, and I want to um, briefly go into how the optic fissure should close during development. So this shows here an optic vesicle that is developing in an optic cup, and the ventral part of the optic vesicle and the optic stalk, which develops into the optic nerve, needs invaginates for this optic cup formation. And this shows in a scanning electron micrograph. This is the ventral part, and you can see um, yeah, how this um, um, invaginates. And if you would take a section through here, you can see here this is the dorsal part of the optic stuff, and this is the ventral. And the hyaloid um, artery grows um, here through this um, opening here. So these two ends, this, this lip here and this lip, they have to grow round and close. And for this to happen, the tissue has to fuse. So this is a, um, a little later stage. So you can see here, this is the optic stalk region. This is the retina. Or this is a little bit more in the retina or optic cup stage. So here, both lips are closely opposed, so they have to attach each other. And then they start to make these cytoplasmic um, bridges until they, they fuse here. And here you have, you have a basement membrane that is on top of these tissues. So the basement membrane has to disintegrate. And if this is not happening for whatever reason, um, you get a um, coloboma or the optic fissure doesn't close. So this is, here you can see that it's, it's actually kind of a zipping up mechanism. Here it's still open, and then here it's nicely fused um, already. There's no basement membrane in between. And this is a mouse model where coloboma is observed. So you can see the lips here, um, they actually attach each other, similar to here, but it's a little bit disorganized. And then later, um, the fissure doesn't close, so you can see a clear borders here and um, uh, the basement membrane is not disintegrated. And in this case here, you can, you can label the basement membrane with this um, um, marker laminin, so this is a control, and this shows basically the same cross-section, and um, here in this lesion here, the retina and the RPE, where they come together, have closed very nicely and laminin is only detectable on the outside of the optic cup. But here, um, you can see that the, um, the ends where they, they come together, they have not fused properly, and the basement membrane um, um, persists. And this is, this is the case in a um, mouse model that, and that's also a, a common human mutation for coloboma. This is when PAX2, the gene PAX2 is disrupted. So in this case, you get a persistence of laminin expression. But you can also get a persistence of laminin expression when there's too much PAX2. 
So either way, uh, modulation of text to expression can lead to coloboma. And this is what we saw here in the porcupine mutants. So we actually, this shows expression of text 2 in the controls and at E15.5, it should be only in the optic stalk. And then in the mutants, we can see an expansion of PEX2 expression. And in this case, we see also um, a persistence of laminin expression in the optic cup in, in comparison to control. So this little line here shows that um, this diffusion has not happened properly. <coughs> so we would like to look in more detail actually what is happening here. Why does um, this, first of all, does PAX2 modified or altered PAX2 expression cause this um, failure of dis disintegration of the basement membrane? So what is, is there maybe an enzyme that needs to be regulated by PAX2 that mediates the degradation of the basement membrane that is um, somehow affected? So this is one possibility. Could be also that cell adhesion, that the attachment is not proper, and there's some adhesion, cell adhesion mutants that um, show coloboma, for example. So also the cells, they have to be able to move around and make this, this movement or a bending, for example, and there are some couple of cytoskeleton uh, mutants that exhibit coloboma. So but we don't know what is actually the sequence of events that is, is on the uh, um, necessary on the molecular level. And I think, yeah, this would be very interesting to look at. So, yeah, basically I've summarized this and these are the people in my lab. Um, so Elizabeth Bank had actually, um, she's a technician in the lab and she did a lot of the um, porcupine work, very nice, um, um, She's a, she's a great um, um, helper in this. And then um, Kayla Dorich is an um, undergraduate in the lab who's helping her. And Mary Colasanto originally identified this defect in the porcupine mutants as a rotation student in my lab. Um, so I want to also thanking, thank my collaborators. So the porcupine project actually is happening in collaboration with Charlie Murtau here at the human genetics department in at the university. And yeah, this is my support. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Do you have any questions or, all right. That's, that's, that, yeah, that's a good question. That's how you go back. I mean, you, um, yeah, you, you keep going back. So the thing is that when you start out, when you start out with an embryo, you have the blastula basically. I mean, that's a more advanced stage and the germ li la layers develop and all these tissues signal to each other. So you have um, very early on, you have signaling centers that signal like an organizer. It's in, in the younger embryos. It's organizer uh, in, in, in lower vertebrates organizer and so this is really early developmental biology so um, these organizers secrete molecules that tell the surrounding cells become this tissue and then it's the organizer still can maintain its activity for a while but then the, the evolving tissues tell other adjacent tissues become this. So everybody is secreting signals and they are, they are, um, the wind si signals are very important. Um, the TGF beta are very important. So there are only a few, I mean not only a few, but there are a few of these signaling or growth factor families that have different functions at different stages of development in different places and they are used over and over again. And often it's also a combination of different signals and the tissues change 
they, they change their responsivity, they change their um, intrinsic um, molecular um, um, how, how this, um, um, signature. So that it's, there's a constant changing of all the tissues and how they interact with each other. So the mesenchyme, they migrate out, they get signals from the underlying neuroepithelium, and, and then they start producing signals by themselves, and they, they signal to the lens ectoderm, for example, also. You can't make um, the lens develops in a specific region above the eye, and why do you not get a lens somewhere else? So the mesenchyme, it turns out that the mesenchyme actually suppresses lens development in the epidermis that outside of the eye. So if you disrupt certain, like wind signaling, for example, um, if you overexpress it in the epidermis and other regions, you can induce more lens, more le little lenses in surrounding the eye. So there's all these different interactions that are suppressive or promoting and make sure that things are in the right place. And between, sometimes these mechanisms are conserved. That's why it's interesting to look in other animals. And the molecules, just the, the, the specific molecules change a little bit. But um, um, certain things you can, you can test better in, in, not necessarily in mouse. Mouse is not always the best system, but um, yeah, other vertebrates are good to, to test this. <coughs> So this, this is the region in the early embryo that kind of um, starts um, a major, has a major impact on um, formation of the mesoderm, one derm layer of the embryo. So the mesoderm um, forms, is important for mesenchyme, for bone formation, for example, too. The soma is derived from the mesoderm. Um, so um, yeah, that's, that's formation of one layer, and the organizer is very important for that. And once you have the mesoderm, the mesoderm actually crawls in a frog embryo. You can see that even in time lapse, it cr the cells crawl underneath the ectoderm, the epidermis, and tell the overlying cells to become nervous system. And that's the, the organizer basically is important for saying, telling cells, hey, become mesoderm, and then they know what to do, where to move, and yeah, to secrete factors that induce the nervous system that you're talking about. <coughs> and that's, that's early, yeah. And then it goes on and on. Yeah, you, you can always, that's the interesting part about developmental biology, yeah, to look at all these interactions and to go back where does what come from, and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we are interested in the role of extracellular signals in the whole pro process of eye development. So right now we focus on RTE development because that's very um, not very well understood. We also look at retina development at the same time, of course, because if we see something, and, and we are interested in retina development too. Um, and we are interested in anterior eye formation because a lot of these manipulations affect the anterior eye, like the eyelid formation, lens development, ciliary body iris differentiation. So we look at this too. And we have a, another project that I didn't talk about today where um, actually the mesenchyme um, could play a major role in, in a defect that we see. So, and yeah. And the coloboma is a new project that we started in the lab, and I, I noticed um, that people don't know very much about coloboma, and it's quite common for disease, and um, the molecular mechanism is not known. And I think that there are several, there might be several mechanisms that lead to coloboma. It's not just one. Um, so that's what, yeah. 